This is a quick overview of our discussion on continental drift and uh, also plate tectonics. And you're going to need to set up a note page that looks kind of like this. Leave yourself some space here to be able to write a few things in as you discover them through the presentation. If you need more time, pause the video. Otherwise, we're moving on. Okay, so continental drift. Wagner's theory, and it's pronounced Wagner because he was German. Wagner's theory that was almost correct. By the end of this presentation, you should be able to explain why plate tectonics is the accepted theory to scientifically explain the motions of Earth's lithosphere. You will need to be able to understand and explain why plate tectonics is the accepted theory. Now that should kind of go into a question, well, if plate tectonics is the accepted theory, is there a theory that is no longer accepted? Well, that's true. That one is continental drift. So because continental drift came first, we're going to discuss it first. We're going to know what it is, what it said, the evidence that Alfred Wegener used to come up with that theory, and there were three pieces, and then we're going to discover the problem with the theory, why it became silent for almost 50 years until a discovery revived it and then made it even more complex with a name change to plate tectonics. So let's start. What was continental drift theory? Well, it was a theory that proposed the continents were once assembled together as a single supercontinent that Alfred Wegener named Pangaea. And here's what that might have looked like. His theory proposes that long ago, all the land masses on Earth were together in this formation, and then through time, the continents moved to their current position. Now, you're going to need some evidence to back up a claim like that, so let's talk about the three pieces of evidence that were his... Uh, linchpins, his anchor points, for the theory. Wegener saw that the coastlines of North America, South America, Europe, and Africa appeared to fit together. And this is something that a lot of us have considered through not just, you know, uh, having any enlightenment uh, from reading any of Alfred Wegener's stuff, but it just kind of looks like that if you just a little, did a little bit of twisting or manipulation, that these coastlines could fit pretty well together, and Alfred Wegener thought the same thing. So this was the first piece of evidence. Here's the second piece. Animal and plant fossils found on these land masses matched between these continents. And these were either land-dwelling or freshwater creatures that would not have been able to survive long-distance swims if the continents were really as far away today as they, uh, as they were in the past, then it would have been a lot more difficult for animals, land-dwelling animals over here, to swim 2,500 miles or more to get over here, or the near 5,000 miles to get over here to Australia or to North America. So these land-dwelling creatures and freshwater creatures and plant species survived and thrived in a time when these land masses were a lot closer together, so there wasn't that far to travel. Finally, the third piece of evidence, locked in the rock layer, suggested that continents experienced different climates than they do today. And these are areas that, locked in these rock layers, are glacial carvings and scrapes that uh, would lead us to believe that at one point the continent uh, in question, say uh, Africa, was experiencing a much colder climate. And that probably means that the continent was located not where it is today, but in a more cold location. And glaciers being able to scrape and make these markings on the ground are what help us to determine that. And that is something that Alfred Wegener saw. So all three of these pieces of evidence led Wegener to the conclusion that all the continents at one point were joined together, and then over time the continents moved to their current 
present day location. Which sounds pretty great, except there's a problem. The evidence points to Pangaea and then continents being moved to where they are today. But when Alfred Wegener was asked how did all of these continents move, he couldn't offer an explanation. And that was a big problem. He could not offer a suitable explanation for how the continents had moved around the Earth. He just didn't know. When pressed on the issue, he eventually came out and said, well, maybe the ocean water pushes them around. Unfortunately, that's impossible. So because of this small piece of information that was erroneously incorrect, people did something wrong. People decided to just disregard the whole theory, which is bad because this right here is the only part of his theory that is invalid. Everything else about his theory makes scientific sense, including all three pieces of evidence that I just shared with you. But people tended to laugh and scoff and then forget the whole thing. So for 50 years, continental drift was left where it was. But then, Elliot Hess, I'm sorry, that's not right, Harry Hess, Harry Hess, uh, a naval officer during World War II, was doing some scans of the ocean floor. And he didn't realize it, but he was about to become the father of plate tectonics. Because Harry Hess made a very important discovery. And he was looking in a place that Wegener never thought to check the ocean floor. What he discovered during his scans and sonar readings of the ocean floor was that he ran into, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, a series, a long range of mountains, something he never expected to find. And at the peak of these mountains were volcanoes. So part of our Earth's asthenosphere is being burped up along the edges here, forming new ocean crust right where the volcano is. And furthermore, some magnetic pole data of the ocean floor confirmed the idea that not only was magma coming through a crack in the ground, but this side of the crack was actually moving away from the volcano, and this side of the crack was moving away from the volcano. The sea floor was spreading. Through dating the ocean, the rocks that make up the ocean floor, we have been able to uncover that the age of the rock close to the volcano, which is the middle of this seam that runs all the way through the Atlantic Ocean, these ages are a lot younger. And the rocks out on the far edges, farthest away from the volcano, those are the oldest rocks. Therefore, the sea floor is spreading. So then we have to ask ourselves, how does seafloor spreading work? Well, here's how it works. The heat from the inner and outer core allows the asthenosphere and mesosphere material to convect. And wherever you have the upward motion of convection, that material is going to split left and right once it reaches the top. Well, that splitting motion is what allows the tectonic plate above it to move in opposite directions, or diverge. And wherever you're going to have convected material that becomes cooler and more dense so it begins to sink, that sinking motion is going to drag the lithosphere above it and it's going to subduct or converge another boundary and sink down into the mantle material to be recycled. So if ocean floor is being created or being uh, generated here, old ocean floor is being reconsumed and recycled somewhere else. And that allows sea floor to spread in one area, but get consumed in other areas. Not to mention, here's some evidence for plate tectonics. If we were able to map out all of the earthquakes and volcanoes that have happened over the previous 50 years, 
which would appear as these red dots, you begin to see that the outline of tectonic plates begins to emerge. So that's very helpful in determining where the positions of these tectonic plates are. Finally, we've been able to use GPS. We've been able to use GPS to, by putting markers in different places along plate boundaries, we've been able to track their motions. And because of satellite data, we've been able to determine that most tectonic plates move at the rate of about one uh, inch a year or about two centimeters a year, which is about the rate at which your fingernails grow. So all three of those pieces of evidence are leading us to believe that plate tectonics is the more accepted theory. Seafloor spreading, seismic activity, mapping out the plate boundaries, and GPS information to tell us how fast those plates are moving. So what should I know by now? This is the end of the presentation, so you should be able to explain why plate tectonics is the accepted theory to scientifically explain the motions of Earth's lithosphere, and you should be able to explain why continental drift by itself is not enough to scientifically explain the motions. Without seafloor spreading, plate tectonics doesn't become the new direction of continental drift. And continental drift by itself is not enough because continental drift does not explain how the plates move. Plate tectonics does explain how the plates move. So hopefully this has been informative and educational. And here again is a look at the positioning of uh, the hot spot, the uh, Pacific Rim hot spot of all these volcanoes. That should also be an indicator of plate boundaries. Hope you've enjoyed this little trip through continental drift and plate tectonics.